It is a beautiful fall morning. Fall is officially here. It is so gorgeous out. Yay. Yay. Let's all stand. We're going to worship him this morning. We've got our new song that we brought out last week. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, You're Donnie. Okay. I wouldn't interrupt you. I'd hit <laughs> Go ahead. We're good. <laughs> Joyful noise to God all the earth, sing glory to his name. Give him all of the glory as worth to exalt him is our aim. We sing praise to his holy name. Come and see what the Lord has. the new song. I don't know if you were expecting that new song first, but this is the new song from last week. So I want you to sing this out. I forgot to tell you, we can sing. If you weren't here last week, we can sing. So sing out loud, sing out proud. You might be a little muted with your mask, but one day those, those will come off and we can fill this room with praises. Amen. Amen. All right, let's keep worshiping. to the well that will never run dry drink from the waters come and thirst no more come all you sinners come find his mercy come to the table he will satisfy taste of his goodness find what you're looking Oh 
Jesus, we just want to thank you. Thank you for your holy presence here in this place. Thank you for the gift of worship and being able to sing and lift up our voices. If we don't, the rocks will cry out. So let us, let us open up our mouths and just proclaim your glory. God, we love you and we praise you. And as we move into this time of worshiping with our tithes and our offerings, I pray that you would, you would bless those tithes and offerings and multiply them and use them to further your kingdom. God, we love you and we praise you. You're a good, good father. It's in your name we pray. Perfect in all love. 
you are a good father and we just thank you right now we just want to lift up our pastor and just pray that your anointing would fall on him Lord God speak through him and use him he studied your word Lord to bring bring it to your people to step on our feet (laughs) to challenge us to be better to move closer to you and that's what we want that's why we're here So, Lord, open up our hearts, open up our minds, and use this for your glory. Lord, we love you and we praise you. It's in your name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. I did. How's that? Now you can hear me. (laughs) All right. It is a good day to be in the house of the Lord to worship and praise God. You know, uh, a few weeks ago I did a a little devotion, and uh, you probably remember it on my cell phone. I'm sure you do. And one thing I said about cell phones are they are wonderful. Cell phones are absolutely wonderful. Uh, However, if we're not careful, a cell phone can actually become our God. We have to be careful. And there's another bad thing about cell phones I wanted to share with you, and that's uh, they can become addictive. You know, I mean, you can't, can't live without them. Uh, that's one of the problems. There's so much that that cell phone can do. I told them, and, and you know, when, when I started in, at North Carolina State University, the computer was a whole city block. That's, how, that's the size of the computer. And, and it didn't have the power that this, this little cell phone has, you know. So it is an amazing thing. But another th- bad thing about cell phones, like I said, they'd be addictive. And we become so attached to them that, that you know, we can't do without them. We, we gotta, and, and, and we have this uh, separation anxiety if, if, we, if we misplace them or lay them somewhere. And there's actually an app on your phone that you can have to where you can locate your phone. I don't know if you used that or not, but it's there. But like everything else in life, that's good and bad things about, right? And the good thing is, of course, cell phones help us with our daily lives. We can keep track of things and directions and all that. But they can also become a distraction. They can be a distraction. And uh, I have to admit, the, uh, early on with the cell phones and me becoming a minister, I became so attached to my cell phone and people calling me and asking me questions that Beth finally told me one day over lunch, she said, I want you to put that cell phone down and give me your undivided attention. You know, she had to, it become a distraction. Uh, another bad thing about cell phones is, of course, we know about texting and driving, right? Or being on our cell phone and driving. Uh, I drove up on an accident a few years back, and, and the accident was the, the young lady had ran a stop sign. And she ran a stop sign because she was on her cell phone. She was talking on her cell phone, and she didn't pay attention to it, ran through. Luckily, neither one were hurt, but what was, the the highway patrolman come to investigate the the, the accident, and he went over to her phone, and she gave it this number. Wait a minute, I'm on my phone. (laughs) 
You know, I didn't sit too well with him. Well, this morning, I'm not here to talk about cell phones, okay? But what I am here to talk about is distractions, okay? Those things that draw our attention away from important things. That's what I'm going to talk about. We have dogs, uh, Beth and I, and when I'm walking my dog, she does pretty well walking, you know, every morning when we go walking until she sees a squirrel. She sees a squirrel and it's squirrel, and she's gone, and she bolts after that squirrel. And if I don't have a hold of that leash, she'll jerk it right out from my hand, and, and she'll take off running. And she doesn't pay any attention. She's so distracted by that squirrel, she doesn't pay any attention to where she's going. And it, it scares me, and I, I won't let go because I'm afraid she's going to run out in the road and get hit. She's in danger because she becomes distracted. And there's a real danger with becoming distracted. Distractions, of course, are those things, whether they're big or small, whether they're planned or unplanned, whether they're preventable or unpreventable. Uh, there are occurrences that take our mind and our focus away from the things that we really need to be thinking on and focusing our lives on. There's those flies that buzz around our heads, aren't they? The noise that we hear and the things that actually come between us and God distractions we read about them throughout the pages of the bible and we witness people of god who in just a moment become distracted from what the purpose is and we read about how their things play out because of their distractions uh, some of those you remember abraham and sarah i'm sure well god promised them a child didn't he but they become distracted because it wasn't in their time frame. And they took matters in their own hands and, and made decisions they shouldn't have. And the book of Judges, there's another story. I don't know if you've read it or not, but it's about Samson. Remember Samson? Almighty Samson? Yeah. Well, Samson becomes distracted by the beauty of Delilah. Well, now, okay. But Delilah becomes distracted by money. And that doesn't turn out well for either one of them. <coughs> In the book of Samuel, 1 Samuel, the Israelites become distracted as well. They see all the nations around them, and they become distracted, and they say, we want a king. We're tired of this God showing us how to live and telling us what to do. <coughs> This is what happens in the fall of the year, by the way. <clears throat> but anyway, they become distracted and they wanted a king. So God gave them a king, didn't he? They got a king. And remember that king, King Saul? Well, King Saul got distracted as well. And instead of waiting for the priest, Samuel, to do the sacrifice, he took matters into his own hand, didn't he? Made the wrong decision. As a result, the Lord rejected Saul, and he said, we've got to find another person to rule. And so this <coughs> Samuel anointed David to be king, a man after God's own heart. It's what Scripture says, David. Yet in 2 Samuel 11, we read where David allows himself to become distracted as well. He looks over and sees Bathsheba, and he loses his focus on what he's supposed to be doing. Well, this morning what we're going to do, we're going to look at a story in the New Testament uh, about being distracted, okay? A uh, story is found in the Gospel of Luke. It's Luke 10, 38 through 42. It's a short story, not many verses about it, and it can be easily overlooked, but it's a story that's worth very much reading and, and talking about this morning. The story begins as Jesus and his disciples, uh, they're traveling like they, they, they do throughout the, the ministry of Jesus. They're traveling from town to town to city to city, preaching the Gospel. And the author begins the story by saying this. He says, Now as they went on their way, he entered a certain village where a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. Now later, later we learn that the city of Mary and Martha is just outside of Jerusalem, not very far from Jerusalem. And of course we all know that <clears throat> at the time of Jesus, they didn't have a fresh chef to go to for lunch. <clears throat> they didn't even have a McDonald's. Can you believe that? Well, anyway, so if you traveled, if you traveled, you had to pack your own lunch. 
And, you know, it, it was so hot, it might spoil, they had no way of keeping it. So a lot of times what they did is they had to go to the local market. They had to walk to the local market. So if you look at the story of the woman at the well in the Gospel of John, you'll see that Jesus and the disciples, they stop by the well and they leave Jesus by the well and they send the disciples into the city to get some food, okay? But today's a little bit different, you see. Martha comes along. Martha's a good hostess. And she says, listen, Lord, why don't you come to my house and, and share a meal with me? She invites Jesus and probably the rest of the disciples over to her house to, to have lunch, if you would. Uh, sometime back I had a message called, uh, Look Who's Coming for Dinner, and I'm sure you remember all about it, but I'll share with you and ask you, have you ever invited someone uh, over to your house for a meal at the spur of a moment? I mean, you know, maybe, maybe an old friend comes to town, some, you run somebody that you hadn't seen for a while, and you say, hey, why don't you come over and have some lunch with me, and let's catch up. Let's catch up. And then suddenly you realize, man, I got more than one mouth to feed. I better get busy. <laughs> well, Martha was not alone. She had a sister named Mary with her. Mary could help her. But scripture says Mary, she had a sister named Mary who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to what he was saying. Not much help is it? It kind of brings back memories to me. I, I've got a younger brother and growing up uh, we didn't have one of those dishwashers. Well actually my parents said we had three dishwashers. My sister and me and my brother. <clears throat> but anyway, my brother was younger than the rest of us. He was the baby, for all you babies out there. And uh, so uh, we did the dishwashing, okay, and, and he watched. Uh, but anyway, I expect most of you can uh, um, share a similar story of that. But the scripture says, but Martha was distracted by many tasks. So she came to him, Jesus, and she asked, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to do all the work? Tell her to help me. Tell her to help me. And there's the word that we're going to focus on today. Distracted by many tasks. Now Martha had invited Jesus, of course, to enter her home. And as a gracious and caring host, Martha goes either into the other room or maybe the other side of the room. And she begins to make meal preparations. That's what a good hostess does, right? Now, Martha's actions are not bad, are they? They're not evil. She's not doing anything wrong. In fact, her actions are the actions of a caring host, someone who cares. Martha has a servant's heart, okay? A servant's heart. She has a true desire to share with the disciples and Jesus. But Mary, Mary is the other sister. Mary, on the other hand, appears to be a little bit lazy, don't she? Yeah. Many of you here know I'm somebody like this. I remember many a time going up to my mother and I said, Mom, make him help us. You know, remember that? <clears throat> well, while Martha is being a good and hostess, preparing the meal and working hard, uh, uh, Mary is at the Lord's feet and she's lazing lounging around, lazily lounging around. It appears that she doesn't have a care in the world, okay? And, Mary, and Martha says, Lord, tell her to get up and help me. Tell her to get up and help me. But here's what the Lord says. But the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and distracted by many things. There, there, there is need of only one thing. And Mary has chosen the better part, which will not be taken away from her. Now, now, wait a minute. <clears throat> What's wrong with what Martha is doing? I mean, she's providing for her guests. She's being a good hostess. She's busy in the kitchen. So why does it appear that Jesus is, is praising Mary, who's doing nothing but laying there listening to him, and, and Martha's busy doing all the work? I mean, aren't we called to serve? And after all, Martha's doing all the work and doing what she's supposed to. Now, I'm going to venture here, I guess, and say that most of us have been in Martha's shoes at one time or another in our life, okay? Whether it was a home and you said, 
I have to do everything. Can't you help me with something? Or whether it's been at church where you feel like I have to do everything. Can't someone else serve? Can't someone else do this? I've witnessed as a pastor staff and laity and yes, even pastors who, who feel like they have so many tasks that they become distracted by the many tasks. And if I be honest with you, I have to admit to myself that there's been times when I've allowed myself to become distracted as well. You see, like Martha, we can at times allow ourselves to be distracted even when those things are not bad or even evil. And even when they seem to be good, be distracted from spending time with God. And we suffer from it. In the text today, Jesus is not addressing the issue of preparing a meal or even being a good hostess. That's not what he's looking at. He's not suggesting that Martha is wrong or even misguided in what she's doing. Let's go back and see what he says. He says, Martha, Martha, you are worried and distracted by many things. There is need of only one thing. Martha has her priorities out of order. She has become distracted and it's caused her to worry. How am I going to get everything done? I need some help. <clears throat> Worried and distracted by many things. Jesus is dressing <coughs> the fact for Martha and for most of us, we become so distracted by life. And that distraction leads to worry. Remember the words that Jesus shares with the disciples just before he goes to the cross? Imagine how worried they must have been when he said, I've got to leave you now. I can't stay with you any longer. <clears throat> it's not going to be an easy out. They're going to come arrest me. They're going to come and drag me off, put me on trial, and then they're going to put me to death. <clears throat> and in the midst of that, Jesus says, do not let your hearts be troubled. That's what he says. Jesus says, in other words, don't worry. Don't allow yourself to become distracted from what the mission is. Now, a little earlier, Jesus says these words. He says, therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you'll eat or what you'll drink, or, or about your body, what you'll wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? So what is the one thing that Martha and we need. What's the one thing? Well, well, Jesus says rather than worry about things that you cannot control, what he says is strive first for the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And, and, and all these things will be given to you as well. You see, worry distracts us from, from thinking clearly, from making rational decisions. And as a result, we, we lose focus, we become distracted. And, and, and what happens is... We become distracted from what we need, the right decision and the better decision. And often, like the stories I shared with you earlier, we take matters into our own hands. Now, I don't know about you. I can't answer for you. But I know what happens when I take matters into my own hands and I make the decisions on my own. I usually end up making a bigger mess than what I started with. Another result of becoming distracted is that it robs us of this peace. It robs us of peace. It robs us. True peace can only come from the one who can provide us that peace. And what Jesus says is, he says, peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. I do not give to you as the world gives. And he says, do not let your hearts be troubled and do not let them be afraid. Distracted. Distractions, if we allow them, can rob us of this peace. You see, when our, when our lives like peace, we go searching to restore that peace, don't we? If we can't find peace, we go, you know, if, 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 if we can't find peace, what do we do? We find something to eat that will give me peace. 
If I can't find peace, what do I do? I, I, I go on a shopping spree. It brings me peace to buy something new or different. Oh, we can't find peace, what do we do? We, we say, well, look, you know, this relationship's no longer giving me any kind of peace, or, or we call it satisfaction, and we become distracted, and we go searching, searching for something that will bring us peace. And when we come to churches and we feel like, well, we can't, we have no peace, what do we do? We go find out another church. I'm going to go somewhere that I can, I can find peace. We may not call it that, but that's what it is. We go searching to restore that peace, and those distractions become those stumbling blocks that prevent us from experiencing peace. We become distraction from the better thing. So how do we live in a world that is always demanding? I mean, our world that we live in is demanding. It demands our time, it demands our energy, and it demands our money. Everything we have, the world demands of us. Everything. So how do we live in a demanding world and not allow life to distract us from that which is good? Well, Mary Simon shows us the way. Okay, You see, Mary put everything aside. She wasn't worried about whether or not we're fed or the meals prepared, or anything. She paused for, for a period of time. She stopped for a period of time, and, and she knew this is the moment of time. I'm going to sit, sit at the Lord's feet, and I'm going to listen. And as far as we know, she said nothing. There, there's nothing says that she carried on. She just listened. Soaked it all in. She stopped, and, and she took time to worship, is what she did. You see, Mary allowed herself for that moment of time to be a disciple. And Jesus tells us, hey, if you want to be my disciple, what does he say? You have to deny yourself. That means put away all these distractions that will keep you from giving yourself 100% and completely to me. Rid ourselves of those things that would distract us. Realign our lives if you will, putting God first. Taking time to spend with God. To speak to God through prayer. How's your prayer life? I mean, how was the last time you sat down and really just poured yourself out to God in prayer? How about listening to God? You know how we listen to God? We listen to God through the reading of His Scripture. God speaks to us through the words of the Scripture. How's your Bible study? You know, uh, Kelly comes up here and, and she'll say, How's your reading going? You know, how's your reading going? Because in the E News, we've got Scripture there to read. And then to prevent us from being distracted, we seek God's affirmation through others. You see, throughout the scriptures, we read of Jesus, of his life and of his journey. And what you'll find is Jesus is constantly separating himself, going away, separating himself to pray. He feeds 5,000, and what does he do? He goes away and prays. He feeds 4,000, what does he do? He goes around and prays. He, he restores sight to the blind, and he goes away and he prays. <clears throat> he removes himself from the world and the crowds, and he takes time to speak to God, to speak to his Father. And, and, and likewise, he listened. He listened because he used Scripture. Go back and, and look and read about Jesus. And Jesus many times quoted from the Old Testament Scripture, the Scripture that he had. And he used that Scripture to know that he was doing his Father's will. And then he found the affirmation through others. <clears throat> As they called him Lord, Master, Teacher. And he even asked the disciples, who do people say that I am? 
Matthew twenty two thirty seven 37 says, Love the Lord with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind. It doesn't say anything about love the Lord your God with all your heart after you've taken care of all the things that you need to take care of. It says you need to put God first. God first. In the scripture, Jesus is a living example of a life without distractions. You see, what happened was God looked on the creation of humanity, of the world, and he said, they need an example of how to live. So throughout the Old Testament, he would send those to put to be examples. But they were human beings, and what do human beings do? We sin. We fail. And they fail. Continually and continually. And finally God said, there's only one that can go and show how to live a life according to my ways. And that's my son Jesus. And he came to the earth and he walked the streets to show us the example of how to live life without distraction. Jesus says it himself. Jesus says, hey, listen, foxes have dens and the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Now, Jesus is not saying we ought to go sell everything we have and be homeless. But what he's saying is we cannot allow anything, anything from keeping us from doing God's will for our lives. We must put God first in everything else then will follow in line. <clears throat> in the busyness of our lives, we've allowed distractions to come between us and God. Have we committed everything to God? And when I say everything, I mean have we committed our life, our finances, our cars, our homes, our jobs, our family? There, there's an old hymn, and, and we've sung it many times, I surrender all. It says, I surrender all freely, all to him I give. Do we? Is that how we live our life? You see, like Martha, we too can become distracted by many things. Since March, for the safety of, of the people, churches have not held indoor worship. Instead of worshiping, they've been uh, online through Facebook and, and YouTube and, and, and radios and any way that we can get the word out, but except meeting indoors. Now, this opens a whole new, new uh, way to, for the church to reach people and to share the gospel message. There's new ways. But it also can allow us to become distracted from what is good. I mean, you think about, whoa. <laughs> I got your attention. <laughs> think about an athlete. You know, an athlete is trained not to be distracted. Okay, because they know to be distracted can cause you to, to drop a ball or or cause you to fall off a horse, or, or whatever it is you're doing, okay? So athletes are trained to focus a, a, and not be distracted. Now, I'm not a professional athlete, okay? But the question is, have we properly prepared ourselves to not become distracted? Especially right now during this this pandemic or whatever it is, this COVID, become distracted that, that we fail to worship God. I, I don't know who said it or when it was said, but I can remember somebody saying that, that, you know, what would happen if suddenly they'd taken all your Bibles away? Now, this has been attempted before in civilization. The question is, would you... Remember enough scripture to stay strong in your faith? Or have we become distracted by everything else that we don't bother reading the Bible? Now, folks, we need corporate worship. We need 
corporate worship, we encourage one another. That's, that, we sing songs of praise that, that lift our spirit and, 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 you know, energize us, if you will. So we need corporate worship. And, and as a body, as a body, together we can accomplish more than we can individually. So corporate worship is very important. However, until we can begin to come back in corporate worship, we still need to take time to worship God. Take time to worship God. Take time. Now, in the beginning, I shared with you some examples of, uh, of these godly people who allowed their lives to become distracted. And as a result, they suffered consequences. And you can read about them. But I want to share a couple of examples with you in the New Testament uh, as we go along here. First of all, is one of Jesus' own, okay? One of his hand-picked disciples, if you would. Uh, he called himself a disciple. I mean, he followed Jesus for the, as long as I know, for the three years that Jesus was in ministry. He was there when Jesus talked about, about uh, the kingdom of heaven. He was there. He was there when the, the blind man received his sight. He was there when the lame man walked, as far as I know. He, he was there. He followed Jesus. He was there when Jesus fed the 5,000, okay? He was there. He witnessed all the things that, that Jesus had done. But he became distracted by 30 pieces of silver. Yeah. He did. Now there's another story I'm going to share with you. It had a little bit different ending. This story can be found in, in the Gospel of Matthew. Matthew, the 14th chapter. It's another one of Jesus' hand-picked disciples. Another one that's followed Jesus through his ministry and walked with him and everything. In fact, it's just after one of his great miracles that the disciples all get in this boat and they, they start to cross the sea. And, and they get out about middle ways and, and, and it's dark and as they're getting out that way, they look out there and there's somebody coming to them. Can you imagine that? Somebody's coming to them. Walking to them. On the water. And, and they take a look out there and they say, well, it's got to be a ghost. And they become frightened. And they, they yell out. And, and Peter yells out in, in fear and he says, Lord, Lord, if that is you, if, if that's you, command me to come out of this boat and walk to you. And Jesus says, come on, big boy. Well, maybe he didn't say it exactly like that. But <clears throat> so what does Peter do? He gets out of the boat. And he walks. He's walking to Jesus. Can you imagine? And all of a sudden, the scripture says that the winds and the waves distract Peter and he begins to sink and, and as he's going down he cries out Lord save me and the scriptures look what it says it says immediately Jesus immediately reached out his hand and caught him and pulled him out Peter become distracted. And when he realized that he was sinking, he cried out to the Lord. With all that life throws our way, folks, what I'm trying to get you to understand is even some of the most godly men and women can become distracted and lose focus. But if we'll cry out, to Jesus Lord save me he's right there he's right there to pull us out to pull us out now listen to me if you, if you continue reading in the gospels I think that what you'll find is you'll find that Martha was able to rid her life of all those those many tasks and all that distraction okay that Jesus was talking about. And she found the one thing that she needed for her life. Oh yeah, 
You're way ahead of me. You know what it is, don't you? That's Jesus. Jesus. That's all she needed for her life. And guess what? That's all we need for our lives. Yeah. His name is wonderful. His name is wonderful. Jesus, my Lord, He is the mighty King, Master of everything. His name is wonderful. Jesus, my Lord, He's the great shepherd, the rock of all ages. Almighty God is He. Bow down before Him. Love and adore Him. His name is wonderful. Jesus my Lord. Let us pray. Gracious God. It's so easy in this world that we live in with all the beauty and all the things that's around us, Lord, to become distracted. And Lord, life is demanding. And, and it seems like in today's, Lord, with, with this, 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 this virus around us, it's even more demanding. I mean, we have, that we have children online and, and mothers having to become teachers and, and teachers having to teach students in the classroom and also online lord oh there's so many tasks that we can become distracted from what is good and that is you lord you're the giver of life you're the one that can bring peace in the midst of this restless world that we live in you're the one that can take away the worry, the doubt. You're the one that promises comfort. You're the one that says, I prepared a place for you and where I go that you may go also. You're the one that says, I forgive you. And you separate our sins as far as the east is from the west. Lord, let us not be distracted from your goodness and your grace. Forgive us for where we have failed you. And Lord, we lift up our, our country. We are so divided in this country today. And Lord, this world is in such a turmoil. We pray for healing. Healing in our in ourselves, healing in our churches, healing in our country, and, and healing in our world. Lord, we thank you for your Son, Jesus Christ. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. <clears throat>